Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Keely Sheridan and I am the Artistic Director of the Irish Classical Theatre Company. I'm very pleased to have with me today two very special guests from our production of Jackie McCarrick's Belfast Girls, which is opening one week from today on Friday, September 22nd, 2023 and running through Sunday, October 15th. Tickets are available at irishclassical.com, and this conversation is a part of our speaker series. So I'd like to first introduce Jackie McCarrick. Jackie is an award-winning writer of plays, poetry, and fiction. She won the 2021 Papatango New Writing Prize for her play Leopoldville and her play Belfast Girls, which was developed at the National Theatre in London and shortlisted for the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize and the 2014 BBC Tony Doyle Award. Belfast Girls premiered in Chicago in May 2015 to much critical acclaim and has since been staged widely internationally with recent premieres in Australia and Sweden. In 2016, Jackie was selected for Screen Ireland's Talent Development Initiative and has recently completed the screen adaptation of Belfast Girls. Her play The Naturalists premiered in 2018 in New York to rave reviews. Jackie, we are so thrilled to have you with us. And I'll also introduce Kyle Locanti. Kyle is the director of our production of Belfast Girls. Kyle's directing highlights include Stella Luna, for which she won an Arty Award for Outstanding Direction of Musical Theater at, uh, or of, of a musical at Theater of Youth. Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, for which she won an Arty Award for Outstanding Direction of a Play at the Duville Cavanoke Theater, and her 2021 production of the Year of Magical Thinking at Irish Classical Theater Company. In addition to Murder on the Orient Express at Shays 710, with All for One Productions, for which she won an Arty Award for Outstanding Production of a Play. Kyle is a retired professor emerita from Niagara County Community College, where she served as chair of the Division of Arts, Media, and Technology. Jackie and Kyle, thank you both so much for being here today. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions prepared for you, and I think we'll let Jackie start off with the first one. So Jackie, I'm curious about your personal pull to this story, specifically the inspiration to write it. Okay, um, Keely, it's just lovely to be here and chat to yourself and Kyle. Um, so the inspiration goes back a, a, a long way. It goes back to about 2010 to play my play Leopoldville, um, which has an all male cast. And I was working on this in London and it's quite a violent play um, based on a true story that happened in Dundalk in the 1990s. Um, and whilst that whilst that play was on during rehearsals and during the production, uh, I just felt, I felt so overwhelmed by the sort of testosterone of this all male cast that I mm. thought I'd really love to write um, an all female piece. And at the time there actually wasn't a lot. I didn't see a lot of those kind of plays around me. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd better write one, uh, but I didn't know what story I should, you know, what it was going to be about. So at the time, if you forward wine, maybe a year or so later, um, we found ourselves an island in the middle of a banking crisis and terrible recession. Um, and you would hear the word famine mentioned on the radio a lot and, uh, you know, high rates of emigration and stuff like that. So um, I just decided one day to Google my own family name. My father grew up in Sligo, he's from Sligo. Um, and I just wanted to see what the story was with McCarrick's and the famine and then I found that one McCarrick I think her name was Nora it may, might have been Margaret I get mixed up with these two um might uh, was on a, this ship sailing for Australia uh with girls known as the orphan girls and at the time I knew nothing about this story there wasn't a lot about it on the internet there wasn't a lot of material um now there's quite a lot of course um, and I suppose I like to think Belfast Girls has contributed a bit to that. But anyway, so I eventually found um, uh, Trevor McLaughlin's book, Barefoot and Pregnant, 
And of course, he talks about a particular group of girls that are known as uh, the Belfast girls who were the most obscene, supposedly, of these orphan girls. And I thought, well, there's my story. There's mm -hmm. my orphan girl story. So I knew immediately that's what I would do. So I just read everything I could. Um, and uh, for about six months or so researched and then I wrote the play pretty quickly. So I suppose a lot of combination of factors, my original uh, what desire to write an all-female piece, having worked on an all-male piece and not seeing enough mm. male, you know, all-female stories on stage, that's April. And then... Um, a sort of maybe family connection and then discovering the story of the orphan girls themselves and the Belfast girls. So, and also being in the middle of this terrible recession, which was a very sort of chaotic time and lots of people I knew um, had to leave and they were going to Australia as well. Um, this kept coming up. This uh, sort of was, I suppose, the energy to write the play. It propelled mm. the writing of the play, I think a lot. Um, so, so that's it. That's how that play came about. Pretty and much. Then, right. And so then Kyle, I'm curious about your pull to direct the play. The, the most immediate thing that struck me was the fact that it was a, a female story, that it was the story of five women. Um, I have directed all female casts, all male casts, mixed casts. And um, I just love the energy in the room when it's an all female cast. And, um, and, and so that spoke to me right away, but more specifically um, women taking agency, women grasping, taking risks and, and taking hold of their, of their, their possibilities, their future in a way that you know maybe wasn't of that time period and maybe even today isn't always possible it's it's not a happily ever after kind of story and i like that too i don't like when the when every every line is is tied up neatly at the end and there's there's questions going forward you know what what will their lives be and jackie was great at, at great. sending a lot of um background information a lot of her resources and so i did a lot of reading and and i was intrigued by that question mark at the end like, they know what's behind them but they don't know what's in front of them but they took the leap anyway and mm -hmm. that that really was probably the the main thing that got me interested in the play. Um, I also love doing historical drama um, where, where fiction and fact overlap and, and meet each other because I love history, I love reading history. And so this, was, this really was on many fronts um, something that spoke to me right from the very beginning. Mm. That actually ties really well. You had mentioned a little bit about what Jackie was sending you. And my next question is what the nature of your relationship as playwright and director have been throughout this process. It's a real resource and, and opportunity um, that we don't always have to interface with the, the, the playwright. Uh, Jackie, I'd love to pass it to you to hear a little bit about what both with this production and perhaps any others, um, mm -hmm. the nature of your relationship with, with Kyle and the production has been. Well, um, I suppose the fact that it, it has had other productions, whoever does it next is going to benefit from this, this, the stuff that, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's carry, it carries forward in a way because mm. I have seen, quite a few productions and I can sort of tell now um, what's going to work and and what doesn't and of course it's entirely up to the people who decide to take this on but I just have some good um, you know I just have some good thoughts on what I've seen that I can pass on and whether the the person wants to take it on board that's up to them and then of course uh, more even after the play is written, I have done more reading. So all of these things um, will help 
the next person. And of course, so, uh, so Kyle uh, was totally receptive to all of this stuff. And, and it, you know, at first it probably just it probably felt like a dump. You know? <laughs> here's, what I felt, uh, here's what I felt has worked. Um, and new thoughts as well, maybe new thoughts on music and stuff like that. So it is quite incredible when you think really, really think about it, how a piece continues to grow through director and then the next director. And maybe sometimes it takes a step back and you learn from that and it's all part of the journey of that piece. And then maybe it grows again. So I think maybe for that to happen, it has to have some kind of thing at the heart of it that's quite stable. You know that it... Mm -hmm. It's not eternal. I don't want to give it that, um, bestow that on it, but something that's quite solid. Anyway, that mm. can, you know, keep being, um, it can grow. It's something that is, it's got, it's got some, something in it that enables um, new perceptions to enhance it in some way. Um, but yeah, so Kyle was completely open to that. And then the whole thing about us having um, a shared, uh, background in movement, of course. Mm. Uh, Kyle was very receptive to thoughts that I had on that. And she thought the same thing that, you know, some kind of, um, I don't want to say stylistic quality, but there's something in there that's not overly naturalistic, I don't think, even though I, I like naturalism as well. But um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I think Kyle was very receptive to 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 what uh, I um, had seen in the past, a shared background in movement. She uh, loved that. And we just kept emailing. So it was quite an intense email situation, emailing situation, even though we hadn't hadn't actually met, you know. So, yeah, you went and mentioned other productions. I mean, other productions the the relationship with the director unless i've been there has been similar you know just talking mm -hmm. and if there's problems or things that are not understood that comes up again and you know same same kind of thing i think it's exciting to hear you talk about your the the fact that your relationship to the play continues to evolve and that you continue mm -hmm. to research and and that it isn't static or fixed in your mind uh, mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. Kyle, then I'm curious what your experience was uh, having the opportunity to to reach out to Jackie and ask questions when things come up in rehearsal. I have so many thoughts about this. Um, first and foremost, this is this is not normal. I don't often. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've directed a show where I've had an actual real time conversation with the playwright and it, it it has it has cemented the idea in my mind that a, that a that writing a play is is really an act of bravery when you when you write a poem or you write a novel its finished form goes out into the world and no one gets to tamper with it when you write mm -hmm. a play by virtue of the fact that you are handing it over to interpretive creative people it's it's there's there's going to be there's going to be interpretation and there's going to be creativity and there's always the chance that it goes in a direction that you didn't see coming and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's maybe not yeah. so good so having this conver having the ability to have this conversation um has been fantastic. I, I have enjoyed it. As I mentioned earlier, so much of the background information that Jackie was so generous about sharing with me gave me such a really solid underpinning for working with the cast and working with the designers. But it went beyond that. There were times when the conversation tilted into um, Jackie's understanding of who these five women are and it has nothing to do or maybe little to do with with the research and the history and more to do with with their their, their personal qualities and their personal characteristics and there again Jackie's generosity to share that information with me which then I was able to share with the cast was so informative and so enlightening and gave us 
maybe what Jackie's talking about with that, that something firm and solid to hang on to as we went about doing our, you know, our mm -hmm. interpretation and our mm -hmm. creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I have found to be very helpful, this is the first time for me as a director working for a live production on this stage. I did a virtual production here, which was an entirely different beast. Um, and this is an arena theater. There's audience on all four sides, theater oh, and lovely. around. And wow. so it, it presented challenges for us that, um, that nudged me in directions, asking questions about um, intention that that I felt like if I had to make, um, if I had to m m sort of rethink some something because of the fact that we have an audience on four, four sides and that the scenic design cannot be what it would have been in a proscenium stage, mm -hmm. I felt solid to do those kinds of things because there was an ongoing conversation with Jackie. And I felt like... Oh, wow. There were times that there were times that I thought, I don't know how to do this in this space and make it work. But, but having a conversation that got to the, the sort of the why we're doing it and the even deeper into a character's motivation in this particular moment helped me and helped us as a as a cast working with me. It helped us make what I think were the right decisions to honor the play and at the same time solve whatever it needed to be solved to work in our space for our patrons to see what what, what the heart of the moment was and mm -hmm. and without without that conversation in real time i i think that would have been a lot a lot more difficult for us right yeah. wow that's a i think wow. that's so interesting to pick at that thread of uh, right the character and kind of coming back to the character as the thing that is sort of the litmus test by which you solve all other problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, I wanted to come back to, to you, Jackie, because my next mm -hmm. question is about how the creative narratives of this piece uh, interact with the historical frameworks, right? We talk about the history match, you know, in, in balance or weight, the fact and fiction. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. But I just want to add, I love that it's in the round and I love that yeah. challenges were presented and then you have to be creative to work around. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, that's just, just brilliant. I love that. Um, I love that thinking because that enlivens everything up. Okay, so the fact and fiction thing, to be quite honest, um, I've thought about this and literally everything is fact. It's just that it's reshuffled. Mm -hmm. It's all reshuffled in different ways. It's hardly, I think I would have felt very insecure if, um, if, or, you know, I would have lacked some confidence if I didn't feel that uh, most of these things have actually happened in some shape or form. For instance, even the giveaway moment on the mast, I don't, and in case anyone's gonna watch this before they watch the play, I won't, I won't say it, but uh, that actually happened on one of the ships that went. I mean, you find this in research, but it was for a different reason, completely mm. different mm. reason. Um, one of the girls had had an, uh, had an affair with a sailor or something like that. Not an affair, but, you know, she'd, she'd uh, had a liaison with him. I think that was the reason. But so there's that. Um, then there was this, uh, another spoiler moment, um, which I don't want to. This whole thing about identity issues, you know, who mm -hmm. are you thing. That happened on the ship as well. People assumed different um identities um so literally all the stuff that's in the ship all the material things that have happened to them i mean as i was researching the fact that judith is from kingston jamaica um that is a factual record that's on the registries one of the girls it, her name wasn't judith noon that's made up 
but um, one of the girls um, was born in Kingston, Jamaica. And as soon as I saw that on the on the registries, I thought, fantastic fact, I've got to grab at that. And I, when people had asked me about this in the past, um, they would say they, you know, they were really shocked that that this would happen in Belfast. And I thought, well, there's loads of trading routes. There's trading routes to the East Indies. As you know, there was lots of trading routes from Belfast at the time. It was a massively important harbour, massively important port. So. Um, and in fact, when I went back, as I said, I went, I even did more research after I'd written it and it's been on. Who does that, right? <laughs> but I did that. Um, uh, and I found yet another uh, person, um, another girl, one of the orphan girls. So there were two, two born in the um, in in Jamaica. So that's quite an incredible thing, and I had to get that in there. Um, so literally, all the all the facts, um, the the. I don't know how much I can give away. So the references right. to yeah, I don't want to say references to terrible things that the uh -huh. girls did whilst they were at home in Ireland are littered all over famine scholarship. You know, right. there's they, terrible things happened, really terrible things. And th that um, wonderful book about women and the great hunger edited mm -hmm. by Christine Keneally is full of these terrible stories. So everything that's in the play happened. It's just that I reshuffled it all, really. And right. I suppose um, uh, maybe that's that contributes to the sense of um you know this solidity or this sense of security at the heart of the piece it contributes to that i think is that it they're both they're really genuine stories it's just i've reshuffled them it's if it was documentary it might you know i'm not a documentary maker but i do like right. to work with as much facts as i can so that's that's that relationship and then, Kyle, I'm curious, from your perspective as a director and being in the room with the the actors who are breathing life into these words and these stories, what your sort of experience is navigating the, the creative and the historical? Well, I'll go back to the ongoing conversation that Jackie and I have had and that, that has um, informed a lot of what we do. Jackie actually sent me photocopies of those pages of the registry of those two women mm -hmm. from Jamaica that then I could share with the actors um, so that we could talk about that, that talk about the fact that, that this is so rooted in reality and it was eye opening for all of us. And, 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 you know, like we all learn in introduction to theater class, you know, the job of good theater is to entertain and enlighten. It's to do both. It's to it's to mm -hmm. teach us something we didn't know, but to entertain, whether you like the play or whether it, it, it should evoke something. And I think that mm -hmm. this ticks all those boxes. It It isn't a museum piece. It's very real, but it's because the history is so real. It's because those terrible things that these women reveal about themselves or the terrible actions that happen on board the ship during this journey are rooted in, in reality, in things that actually happened to people who were in this similar circumstance. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's taking facts and giving us truths and that's i really love that when when a historical drama can do that and i feel that that's something that jackie has done very successfully in this piece so thank you jackie <laughs> thank you mm. thanks kyle thank you i love that uh that idea of fact and truth and kind of how they mm -hmm. write a fact feels maybe a little more clinical but mm -hmm. truth right is mm -hmm. a, a real lived mm -hmm. thing so then mm -hmm. in our last few minutes, I wanted to pass it back to you, Jackie, to ask uh, what, your, uh, what your thought is on what aspects of this story, though it takes place in the past, uh, might resonate with a contemporary audience. What feels like it calls out to us now? Yeah, um, it's strange because 
it's been on during um the the me too movement and me too would have been mentioned um and then i think when trump was in power and this the whole thing about you know the emigration and the wall and all that stuff these things were mentioned in reviews as well so it i think the reason why this happens mm -hmm. is because i wrote it and it's going back to the time that i wrote it during this terrible period of the banking crisis and recession in Ireland, sort of 2011, 2012, which was really terrible. I mean, people's houses were seized. I think we paid bondholders something like 64 billion euro. Um, I mean, Ireland has bounced back, you know, miraculously, which is brilliant. But that was a terrible time post post that layman's crash banking banking crisis of 2008 it was a really terrible time here um and i was very angry at the time that we had paid these bondholders so much money when so many so many um groups said we didn't have to pay it but we did pay it it bankrupted the country the imf were called in and years later german um bondhold germany said um well maybe you didn't have to pay us after all but i mean had had we nego pushed negotiated a bit much maybe we would not have had to have bankrupted the country that whole period is very contentious and by the way i'm very pro eu it's just that was a very difficult time for ireland um so i was very angry about that that the state was giving away what it seemingly didn't have and causing such chaos in um in the country and when I think about what Arthur Miller does in The Crucible, and that was in my mind, you know, Arthur Miller writes a play that's um, in the middle of the McCarthyite period that's about, you know, witch burning and witches. And um, so there's this allegory thing going on. And I thought, you know, I'd like to sort of have an element of that in the play of that anger. Why are we giving away what we don't have for the, what? The, why is the state giving away what um, what it doesn't have? Which is what Ireland did during the famine. It gives away its people, gives away uh, its grain. This whole laissez-faire um, policy of economics. Um, so, not many people pick up on the allegorical aspect of the play, and that's totally okay but it was an impetus when I was writing it for sure. So I think um, I think the reason why, going back to your question, how current, um, how it's felt currently is this, this sense of the state against agency of particular groups. Um, that's because I infused it with what I was feeling at the time. And so that's there. And therefore, whatever happens, whether it's me too, or, um, you know, if it's, or if it's about gender, or if it's some group feeling very disenfranchised, that's, that's in the writing anyway, mm. because that's, you know, one of the reasons why I probably haven't explained that very well. That's one of the reasons why I wrote it is in this very this this time when Ireland was having echoes of the famine, you know, the, the, the phrase the famine kept coming up in the media, um, evictions were happening left, right and centre. So this allegorical thing was on my mind, certainly a lot of rage about that. And so, yes, the story is really, a, is definitely the orphan girls and the Belfast girls, but uh, this anger about how the state goes against um its own people is in is in that play and i think that's picked up on what what it, because we are we are in times where there are you know there are um there's a lot of political upheaval in the world and mm. you know so whatever the issue it's i think it speaks to those issues it just does so i think that's what's going on there that's my thoughts yeah. on that thank you i'll pass the same to you kyle uh Jackie what now? Has, yeah. Jackie has given Judith uh, this wonderful line where she is reflecting on, on her feelings and what's going on. And she says, it's the way the world works I'm angry at. And that mm -hmm. to me 
that has been sort of a hallmark thought that that has stayed in my mind through through all of the working on the play. Um, the the allegory, the crucible idea is something that we discussed early on. The cast was, you know, was very aware that this that this play works on that same level that the crucible and the McCarthyism period, you know, that 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 was happening um, when Miller mm -hmm. wrote this yeah. play. For me, it's it, it's this it, idea that the um, the sort of disconnect between when decisions are made by people in power, by decision makers, oftentimes, and even today, oftentimes male, oftentimes wealthy, and yeah. that the results are born on the backs of society's most disenfranchised people, yes. oftentimes not male and rarely wealthy. So, so that that's there through the whole thing. And I, I, I don't, I hope that 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 is something that the audience will, you know, will ponder on the way home. Um, I, I, I believe it's there and I believe it is, you know, it is it is there and it's not so hidden or buried that, you know, very, yeah. very few people will get to it. I, right. I just I just to me, that's what that's the connection to today and whether it's whether it's me too or whether it is you know wealth disparity or you exactly. know, sort of the the dying away of a middle class with all the all of the money trickling up and you know leaving the have nots so disenfranchised i think those things are in there and i think it makes it gives the story a weight and a and a, a depth so much more than than the individual story of these women on mm -hmm. this boat. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And yet, yeah, I think I, I agree with everything you both said. And and for me, I think what excites me the most about this play is that it, it takes this very sort of recognizable period and topic in Irish history. Everyone's heard of the famine, right? But with just a little scratch mm -hmm. of the nail, you start to see the human experience of that mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. the kind of like, broader historical textbook facts. And I think that does mm -hmm. lend a kind of weight, right? There's the weight of the moment mm -hmm. of the history mm -hmm. and the weight of what these women are experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, fabulous. Well then in our, our just it really briefly, because I'd love to, to leave it on a, a note of moving forward. Jackie, did you wanna share What's next for you? What are you, what are you working on now? What's up next? Yeah. Um... Oh, so many things. Uh, this year, I've been on attachment to the National Theatre in London, which is so lovely. Um, I was there already, but I have to go back. Um, and I'm working with a director that I've worked with before, Svetlana Dimkovic. She's a Serbian director, um, wonderful director. She, um, I have this idea, uh, which I'm, we both of us researched it, but I'm starting to write it now, which is great. And I'm going away to um, a place called the Tyrone Guthrie Center in, mm -hmm. in Monaghan for two weeks now on Monday, actually for um, to, to write it. <laughs> no, but I've actually started already. I've started, but anyway, what is it about uh, in a sentence? Um, it's quite a harsh subject since the troubles ended in the north of Ireland, um, the domestic violence figures have gone through the roof. And there is a statistics, uh, statistic like um, that's, that says uh, every 16 minutes there is a domestic violence incident in the north. So mm. I'm trying to, there's, there is a, some material, not a lot, but there is some material that connects the, the troubles the trauma from that period with the violence that has ended up in the home because where does it go right we've never had a truth and reconciliation um thing in in ireland about the troubles uh south africa has had one but we haven't had one here and it's very right. contentious because who do you blame who's going to get the blame that's quite a, a sore point here 
Um, so something has happened and uh, I'm looking, I've looked at lots of um, things about, you know, women and uh, loss, maybe a little loss of uh, agency in the north of Ireland, I think. Mm. Um, but anyway, so it's about that, but I'm not doing it in, I'm not writing it in a voyeuristic way. Um, and I have to be quite careful because I'm, I've am i set it in a refuge that's across the border, it's in Warren Point. Um, I've set it in a refuge, but I've got this, feeling that I want it to be uh, a little bit of more magic realism in there which I've not really I've mm -hmm. you know I've read magic realism but I've not written it as a play in a play uh, context um, so there's things I want to do with it that are quite and because I'm calling it sirens but because I also want to look at the whole sirens thing and it's near the sea of course I, I want mm -hmm. to look at the whole thing sirens in Ulysses um so there's lots to explore but I also we've also explored the um the changes in women's lives in uh post-communist countries like for instance Yugoslavia uh and it's you know it's an awful thing to think that uh for many women life was better so because the reason i say this is because there's there was a job there was a roof right. there was education and i'm not you know promoting one for, um political philosophy over another or anything like that but i'm looking at it i'm just looking at these things um <laughs> and i'm going to try and combine some stories serbia bosnia um and northern ireland and of course, I, you know, I've got a lot of things going on with that. So it's all in the mix. It's not written yet. Uh, I've got some monologues from for certain uh, characters that are there. So even the the process has been the same as Belfast Girls, and that I've done a lot of research. Hmm. But it is a different creative thing in that um, I'm I'm trying to do different things with it. Who knows? At the end of it, I just might do something very straightforward but i don't know yet so I'm, I'm allowing other things to come in the mix and when it's done there just might be traces of those things if you see what i mean mm. so yeah. uh, by and large the story is it's it's uh just looking at this whole thing about post um po domestic violence connecting with the troubles in the north and the trauma of uh war um and or you know how things the things that happened in the north where does it go where did it end up and a lot of the times it ended up in the home so it's looking at women again i suppose um that's that's no it's all it sounds so i'm still right i'm writing that i'm writing that now amazing i cannot wait mm. until it's mm. in a, a stage where where we get to 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 share and hear yeah. and learn about it yeah it's to have a big cast. I want it to have a big cast. Mm. So, um, and I, I hope I can shift times. Uh, I do think it'll have more than one location. And I'm reading actually. I haven't read it yet, but I've, I've, um, I've sort of skirted around the edges of Tom Stoppard's The Coast of Utopia. Mm. So that's a big, big play about all these philosophical thinkers the 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 thinking of which results in communism you know and i just think that's very fascinating so i'm looking at that i might necessarily agree with stoppard politically i don't think i do i don't think we're on the same page but i think what he does with the play is uh because it's it's huge you know this was a nine hour thing um and it's three different plays, but what he does with it is interesting. So I'm going to be looking at that. So that's what I'm attempting, something quite large. Yeah. Amazing. And Kyle, I'll pass the same question to you. What's, well, you've got, you've got tech for Belfast girls. <laughs> so maybe yes. it's, it's hard to see beyond that, but it, uh, it, it any is thoughts on what's next. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, we're, we see the light at the end of the tunnel here. We're mm -hmm. going into the, the final week of rehearsal, the tech, 
um, portion of the rehearsal. And once that opens and I have a little bit of a, of a hiatus, after the first of the year, I'll be working with a, um, a playwright named Michael Eichler. He is uh, in Los Angeles, but incidentally was a graduate of a local college, Buffalo State College. And oh. as part of their 50th anniversary of his graduating class, he has written a play called 6970 about the year where the draft was reinstated in the United States and the student violence and unrest was going on in Kent State and all of that. And so he has invited me to work with him using students at Buff State and alum from Buff State to do uh, a reading of that as part of this 50th reunion celebration for his graduating class that comes up, um, I think near the end of the year. And then um, the next the next full production, there's a wonderful, wonderful children's theater company here in Buffalo, uh, child, uh, Theater of Youth. And mm -hmm. I always love working over there with them. And so something completely different to <laughs> jump into Go Dog Go Children's Theater um, but I am looking forward to it. They, it's a it's a great place to work, and they do they do a wonderful job introducing theater to the school children around the area, Buffalo proper, and the surrounding suburbs. So I look forward to that. It will be very very different than what we're doing now, but both really wonderful experiences. Right. Amazing. Well, I that concludes my questions. I just wanted to sum up by reminding our audience at home that uh, we hope that you will join us for Belfast Girls, which opens Curtain Up Friday, September 22nd, and runs through Sunday, October 15th. Tickets are available at irishclassical.com. Jackie and Kyle, thank you so much for your time and your insights. It was a pleasure speaking with both of you. Thank you. One thing I learnt in the great hunger, the world is alive and on the move. By order of the Right Honourable Earl Grey, the Crown seeks female orphans of 19 for sponsored passage to the colony of Australia. It needs new leaders to face the far unknown dancing. How many days is it down under? Uh, three months. Australia will need her sisters and mothers and daughters. What are you going to be? An actress, maybe. To play Puck from A Midsummer Night's. Who can dream? If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. Where's Hannah? Haven't I heard? It's only the dead survive in Australia. This is no Bible. How does a Belfast girl get a book? The world is away and moving. I'm sick of the lies. What is she hiding? No! A time of women is coming. Liars! All of you! Stay back! Did we leave Ireland? didn't leave Ireland at all, it spat us out. It's your dream for Australia. I don't believe in dreams. I believe the world is alive and on the move. My God, you better be ready for us.